Salam sejahtera and a good day. In this session, we shall be talking about data management and their related descriptive statistics. And what does all these values tell us about the characteristics of the variables that you are studying? Data management is a critical part of research. A sound data set should have the following attributes. The data should be traceable. The data should be reliable. That means they can be verified and they are valid in terms of accuracy and precision. They are also repeatable. That means they are easily reproducible. They are accessible for auditing and rechecking purposes. And you should also have a plan in place to preserve the data. So that means you should plan out how to store the data and how many backups that you have and where to archive or to store the backups. And tools of the trade that you can use for data management may span from the easily accessible Microsoft suites of softwares to maybe much more specialized data storage softwares. And not all research requires statistics. Therefore, don't be too obsessed about describing the data characteristics because certain studies that are qualitative in nature may not depend solely on data management. Well, having said that, in summary, if you have a good data and a well research, well, well researcher, then you of course can have a well done research. If let's say any flaws are happening to the data or the researcher becomes ignorant of what they have, then it will be a very difficult uh, endeavor for research. And oftentimes we rely on data cleaning procedures, transformations, or even non-parametric statistical analysis to analyze our data. And always compare data to the known norms of your field to check for data authenticity and integrity. Because no doubt you could be dealing with faulty measurement methods, uh, operator error, and a host of other potential issues that could lead to the validity uh, of your data being questioned. What is descriptive statistics? Descriptive statistics are meant to reduce a data set to a management, manageable proportions, summarizing the trends and tendencies within it. This is actually in order for us to present the results clearly. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, uh, involves the estimation of population parameters using a sample or representative data. This they, this estimation is usually followed by hypothesis testing based on inherent assumption underlying the selected statistical techniques. And the selection of statistical techniques is very much dependent on the variable types and of course, your hypothesis. For data screening, the first step should be data cleaning and exploration. It is important for you at this stage to identify suspicious data sets. It may range from typo error, measurement errors, to maybe even more uh, sinister operator error. And based on that, we should be ruling out outliers because outliers can be very detrimental to correlation and regression analysis. This is actually the situation where we rely on well-tested statistical theory, for example, uh, standard deviation. It's actually a rule of thumb for us to accept three standard deviations as a range and, and anything that is actually more than three or four standard deviations should be treated with a suspicion that it is actually a potential outlier. But of course, do refer to the typical norm practice in your field on how actually to screen for outlying values. And then it is also important for us to check for distribution pattern and other properties of the data to determine whether the data is normally or not normally distributed, which we shall see later in the examples, because this will actually affect our selection of statistical tests. This actually has been outlined in our earlier videos. At the same time, you should also notice or look out for certain trends that are actually pre uh, present within your data itself. Are there any clustering or fanning uh, a phenomenon observed among your data whereby data could be uh, uh, grouped together uh, in, certain, in certain parameter or maybe in a stepwise manner? They indicate could be because of your measurement errors or could be operator errors. The best way to determine clustering or fanning is actually via the use of scatter plots and clustering may complicate correlation and regression analysis. Once you have done that, it is time for us to check for outliers and conformance normality and other data irregularities using the following tools. 
namely the box plot, the stem and leaf plot. And then of course, by relying on the range of quantities, for example, SD, SE, range kurtosis, skewness, and normality plot. As I mentioned earlier, anything more than four SD values, there are more than four SDs away, could be a suspect outlier. And we typically use Komogoros Mernos or Shapiro Works test to determine whether the data is normally distributed or otherwise. And some statisticians will even suggest coefficient of variation for us to visualize the variable, variability of the variables itself. However, do note that SPSS does not recommend the use of coefficient of variation or CV to look at variability of the data. Now, let's look at this particular example. This is an experiment conducted to examine the effects of diet A on the cholesterol content of mutton versus untreated sheep. The group A comprised of 10 sheep was treated with diet A and 10 more control animals was treated with the control diet. And let's assume these are the results from these 20 animals. Based on that, we first need to clean up the data. So to clean up the data, we need to use the explore functions in SPSS. Go to analyze descriptive statistics to access the explore function. The following menu will appear and then you at this point, you just need to put the relevant variables in the right panels and click on plots. The plots is actually, clicking plots is actually very important because in SPSS, it will actually allow us to access the option normality plots with tests. This is actually where you access the normality test because uh, by default, this function is actually not invoked. So by accessing the plots, then you will be asking the computer to calculate and determine whether the data is normally distributed or otherwise. Click continue and then okay in the next menu, explore function should be running. And this should be the results that you are getting based on the procedure that we have performed just now. So based on this, it is clear that uh, all the variables are included in this case. Remember, we have 10 variables per group. So by right, all 20 of them should be showed up as a valid data sets. And next to it, you will see the values for each of this uh, each of this treatment group. First we'll, to come into picture will be the control group. So it's showing you all the 5% trip mean, the median, the variance, the standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and all other quantities of interest. Do pay attention to the skewness and kurtosis indicated here. So this is actually the value for group control. Likewise, you can actually see the values of group A when you scroll down. So you can see here on top is actually the value for group A. And based on this as well, you can also see the output from the normality plots. Output from normality plots will give us output for two tests, the Komogorov Smirnov and Shapiro Wilkes. These two tests will actually tell you whether your data is normally distributed or otherwise. How do you interpret them? In general, if the test is actually not statistically significant or the p-value is more than 0.05, then the parameter will be normally distributed. And by convention, we typically use Shapiro-Wilkes for samples that are below 200, okay, below 200. Some will even say below 50. So if let's say you have sample size that is actually below 200, then you will rely on results from Shapiro-Wilkes. Komogoros Smirnov is typically used for sample size that are more than, groups with sample size that are more than 200. So over here, you can clearly see that our parameters for control, parameters for group A are actually normally distributed because the p-value is more than 0.05. Now, the next to check will be SD, SE, and the trim mean value. Now, one thing to note is that the CV, which is actually given by the value of SD over mean, should not exceed 0.2 or 20% of the mean itself. And then a check for normality, apart from the Komogoros Smirnov, you can also check for normality using the following criteria. The first one being skewness and the second one being kurtosis. Now, what does skewness tells you? A skewness for a normally distributed value will range between minus two to plus two. 
when the skewness is negative, it means the mean is less than median. So that means you have a left skew, whereby the left tail is typically a longest. When the ratio of the statistics over standard error is actually positive, it means the data is positively skewed or mean more than. You can also see for ketosis, the next, which is actually the next quantity, it can be described as the peakedness of the curve itself. So you have leptoketotic, mesoketotic, which is the normal ketosis, and the platyketotic. Now, what does ketosis tell you? Ketosis measures the spreads of distribution, which is again given by statistics divided by standard error in your SPSS table there just now. And normal distribution is actually between minus two of the value two plus two. And when the ratio is negative, you have mesoketotic, which means the value is actually uh, you indicating a short tail end of distribution. And when you have a, a positive ratio, that means it's actually a platyketotic. That means you have a long tail end of distribution. So this will be some of the values that is actually that you need to depend on to see whether your data is normally distributed or not. And the issue will be when you have values that are actually in between. For example, ketosis meets the definition of normal distribution, whereas the skewness doesn't. Then what would be your decision? So I would recommend that we go back to the normality plots, look at the results of the Komogros Smirnov or the Shapiro Wilkes to determine whether your data is normally distributed or otherwise. Apart from that, you can also use the normal QQ plot for to determine whether the data is normally distributed or not. In this case, we know that they are normally distributed when the values are all equally spaced uh, above and below this uh, equal probability line indicated here. And of course, as, uh, as indicated earlier, the Komogros Smirnov and Shapiro Wilkes will be the best way to determine. And we need a non significant value, as I indicated earlier, for you to have uh, 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 an inkling that the data is normally distributed. So, this is actually further description of the data that we have reworked on. Now, looking at the stem and leaf plot, it just simply tells you how the distribution is like. The stem and leaf actually tells you what will be the major stem number and the leaf number. For example, in this case, it tells you that there are two numbers, 96 and 98. The stem is nine and then the, the leaf will be six. So in this case, it tells you there are two individuals starting with nine, so 96, 98. And then there are three individuals with stem starting at 10, for example, 100, 102, 105, and so on and so forth. So in short, this gives you a rather good visualization about the distribution of your data itself. Now, apart from that, you may also need to look at the uh, location of the outlier by looking at this particular graph. In this case, this is a box plot. Remember, when you look at a box plot, you are essentially looking at a distribution curve from the top. So just imagine this is the curve and then you are looking at the entire curve itself. So the upper limit of curve is actually the largest observable value that is not an outlier, which is typically 95% of the limit. And then the lower lower band of the curve here is actually the smallest observable value that is not an outlier. Typically, it's actually the 5%, the lowest 5%, where the largest value is the upper 95%. And in between, you have a list of percentile values, which is the 75th percentile, the median, which is actually the 50th percentile, and the 25th percentile, which is actually a quarter here. So all this will actually be able to tell you how well your data is actually distributed. And in, at this case, at this point, all values that are above the largest value observed and below the observed value, uh, uh, observe, observe, smallest value observed, are something that you need to pay attention to. In fact, if let's say there are more than four SDs, you need to be prepared that this could be potential outliers. So you will come to a situation that you determine the data and then it tells you that your data is not normally distributed. So what should you do? If let's say your data cleaning exploration stage tells you that, then you have several uh, options. 
Number one is of course, you need to select a non-parametric test to evaluate or assess uh, analyze your figures. And number two, you may have to go for transformation, which is actually what we're going to talk about at a later, at, at later stage, at a later video. How do you transform them? You can transform them using natural log or base 10 log, squaring, square rooting, arcshine, inversion, etc. And once you have done this, it is also important for you to retest the transform values for conformance to normality prior to your analysis.